Dr. Haber. Okay, are all of these mics working? Sounds all right. Okay. Do you think this is what Taylor Swift feels like on the air, Stuart? <laughs> okay. So as Dr. Dr. Haber said, uh, I'm excited to be here. I came down from Saskatoon because I do like to be able to give a presentation in person. So I'm excited to see how many people are here. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you about shoulder biomechanics um, and taking it into the wild. That's my fun way of saying we validated some in-lab measures and are trying to take them into field. So I'm here to kind of take you through that journey uh, that we've been on in the lab. So before we get going, um, I do want to do a land acknowledgement. I live and work in Treaty 6 territory. Most of the work I'm presenting is. I believe we're on Treaty 4 right now. Um, so I'd like to pay my respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship. So a little bit about me before we get in to the science. I am a Saskatchewan girl born and raised. Uh, I grew up in Melfort. So if anyone's not from here, that's two and a half to three hours northeast, depending on who's driving, how fast we're going to get there. Uh, my parents still live there, so I'm still there quite a bit. Um, I was saying to Dr. Haber when I walked in, it's always a blast from the past when I come here, because I actually remember playing volleyball in this building as a high school student. So things really do come full circle here in Saskatchewan. Oh, I know, I need to carry this with me, <laughs> yeah. I went on to do my Bachelor's of Science in Kinesiology at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, from there, I became interested in biomechanics, so I went on to do my Master's of Science in Kinesiology at the University of Waterloo. I focused a little bit more on the occupational side of things there. Uh, then I returned to Saskatoon to do my PhD in Health Sciences. So there I had the opportunity to, to combine what I knew about biomechanics with some more clinical applications. I worked with some physiotherapists. Um, and my research now really combines all of those concepts. I have a more of a basic science stream, um, an ergonomic stream, and a clinical one. And today we're really going to focus on the basic science leading into the ergonomics. Uh, and now I'm an assistant professor in the Canadian Centre for Rural and Agricultural Health. I'm actually in the Department of Medicine. So that's an interesting place to be as a PhD doctor and not an MD doctor. Uh, so when I tell people what I do and I'm in medicine, I always have to be like, not that kind of doctor though. Don't come to me with your rashes and your coughs and your broken bones. And so, well, maybe broken bones actually uh, would be interesting. So our objectives for today, um, as I said, we're going to talk about biomechanics and how that's related to injury and work. Uh, so first I hope to discuss the role of biomechanics in the development and treatment of shoulder musculoskeletal disorders. By the way, from now on, I'm, I'm just going to say MSDs because I think we can agree you don't want to hear me say musculoskeletal that many more times and I certainly don't want to say it that many more times. So we're going dis to discuss the concept and the importance of it. Then we're going to review some shoulder specific procedures for measuring shoulder kinematics or biomechanics. We're going to talk about some of the challenges that exist and some of the progress that I think I've made um, in order to address them. Uh, then we'll discuss uh, applying this uh, for infield research and then take you a little bit into these actual infield applications. Spoiler alert, a lot of that's in progress, so it's a really brief introduction to the end. First, though, a biomechanics refresher. We're all kinesi kinesiology students here, right? So at least, hopefully, we've heard this term. Uh, but to get us all on the same page, biomechanics, I always say is body movement, right? Bio, body, or living. Mechanics is movement. Um, and today, we're going to talk a lot about kinematics. That's really my favorite part, I guess. Uh, when I say kinematics, I mean motion of the body without really being concerned about the forces and moments that it took to get there. So think about what your arm position is without necessarily how much work each muscle had to do to get to that position. Not that that isn't important, and that's an obvious ne next step to some of this research, but you can make inferences about the forces and the kinetics from kinematics. So that's one thing I really like about it. Um, I should also say, we're going to talk exclusively about the shoulder today. Uh, that's my expertise. It's not that the rest of the body isn't important. I just mostly care about the shoulder, so that's what you've got today. <laughs> I also want to introduce um, some motion capture, motion measurement systems, because I'm going to talk a lot about this today. Uh, hope you're prepared. It's going to be a, a relatively methods-heavy lecture, because uh, we still have a lot to do with our figuring out our methods for the shoulder. So I'm going to talk a lot about optical motion capture. Has anyone, I know there's a Vicon system here. I've used it. Has anyone seen it? Eh, have you guys seen Okay, a few of you. 
So optical motion capture, I use Vicon, there's other options out there. It's these cameras right here that send out reflect or infrared light, sorry, and see, oh, did I lose it? Oh, see reflection, um, the gray markers on this person. Oh, hello, did I hit a dead spot? Um, are reflective. So the infrared light goes out, it sees reflection, and I can track the movement of the body that way, or anyone can, really. Um, so this would even work if you had a Lululemon symbol on your pants, you know, or whatever clothing you have, that's reflective. It shows up exactly like a marker in Vicon. So you always have to tape over it. Um, so that's our lab-based system, right? It's a camera, so it sends out light. It has to see the marker. It has to see the reflection. So it's pretty much all done lab-based because you're not going to take these cameras out into like a baseball diamond with all the sun and stuff. That wouldn't probably work very well. So the other motion capture system we're going to talk about our inertial measurement units. I'm going to use the term IMU throughout the talk. Some people also call these wearable sensors, or they're at least some version of a wearable sensor. As opposed to cameras, they are these little orange squares. So whereas the cameras see the markers and we calculate motion, the sensors already know how they're oriented in space, kind of like how your phone knows how it's oriented, like if you're going to play a game. It uses similar technology to define the orientation of each sensor, and then we can put it on the body and actually track the body. So the picture there is actually um, an application that I'm going to touch on at the end. Um, we were at a, a mine site up north, and we put the sensors on this person. You can see the straps on his arm. You can't see there's one under his... Sh um, shirt on each shoulder, his chest, and we had to put one on his hard hat. We wanted it on the head, but we had to encounter the hard hat issue. Um, so they're relatively unencumbered with it on. He could then put his coveralls on or whatever, his jacket, and you can still track motion that way. So in theory, you should be able to take these out anywhere, into the wild, if you will, um, with some considerations and measure movement. movement. Another concept I want to introduce, because we're going to talk a lot about it, is the idea of how we calibrate our system or calibrate our marker setup or our sensor setup with each of these systems. Um, because in order to define motion, we need to have the sensors and the markers in particular places to do the math that we need. Um, but it's not always as straightforward as just putting them exactly where we want them to go. Fortunately, in biomechanics, we work off of a what's called a rigid um, body model, a rigid segment model. And the idea is that each segment of your body on each segment of your body, rather, every point on that segment moves the same. So that's to say that this part of my arm moves the same way, oh, I'm sorry, as this part of my arm, or my leg. This part of my leg moves the same way as that. It's a rigid body. There's, in theory, no change between those positions. And so this is nice because, ooh, I already said that. Um, this means that we can put our markers or our sensors on a part of the segment that's easy to track or easy to measure, um, and then recreate the important points for math. So if I, um, here's, I got an example for you guys. So example is the medial epicondyle of the humerus. Hopefully we've taken a little bit of anatomy in this room, but we'll quickly review. Uh, lateral epicondyle is on the outside of your elbow. Medial epicondyle is on the inside of your elbow. So this is a picture of a calibration pose. So that just means a, a static pose where the camera is and we can see all of the markers. So you can, hopefully you can kind of see with this lighting, the media, medial epicondyle marker kind of poking out down here. I'm going to point right there. But in our other picture here, um, she doesn't have the markers on. But her arms are by her side, right? And now. Where are you, medial epicondyle? I can't see you. You've moved your arm, and this happens a lot in functional movements, right? You don't live your life doing things like this. You often bring your arms by your side. You take a drink of water. You comb your hair. You reach above. And we would lose, for instance, the marker that's on the medial epicondyle. But because we've done a calibration, and I can see that marker square on her arm, that's OK because I have that marker square, and it all moves together. So the, because I've done this calibration, I can do my calculations. So this is the concept that we use a lot. I mean, some systems are actually built on this concept. Um, and it, a little more straightforward for the arm, less so for the shoulder blade or the scapula. And get buckle up, we're going to talk about that a whole bunch in a few slides. First things first, though, now that hopefully we're a little bit on the same page about some terms and some methods, uh, I want to sell you 
on why I'm even looking at this at all. So why do we care about shoulder biomechanics at all? Why is the way that our arm moves, our humerus, our scapula, why am I dedicating basically my whole research program to it? Well, let me tell you. It's because there are important biomechanical components to both acute and chronic MSDs. Um, so MSDs are injuries and disorders. So pretty much anything to your musculoskeletal system, your muscles, bones, nerves, tendons, joints, all of that. Any injury to that would be an MSD. And whether that's an acute injury, so it happened from one event, or a chronic one that happens over time, biomechanics play an important role in a lot of them. And MSDs are a problem because they're painful, right? You don't usually get an injury and then it's a transient event and you don't have pain again. Usually the pain stays, so it's persistent. And then along with that, we have limitations in mobility, dexterity, and overall functioning. So not only does it reduce people's ability to work, but even just to do the things they enjoy, right? If you, a friend of mine on my, I just play adult safe hockey, uh, one of my teammates is out right now because she hurt her wrist doing something else. And so because of that, she can't do something she enjoys, which is playing hockey. So MSDs are prevalent and they're an issue, and that's why I care about them. Uh, and biomechanics, and specifically kinematics today, are what we're going to talk about, are associated with MSDs, as the point that I made. So now I'm going to walk you through a little bit of that. Uh, the first motion that is strongly associated with MSDs is humeral elevation. So I'm, it looks like we have lots of room here, so I'm gonna get everybody to pick an arm, any arm you want, and let's lift it up and down, say like eight times in a row, fairly quickly. Hi. <laughs> okay, so even just, you know, I've, I don't know how many I've done, eight or nine, can you start to feel your arms working a little bit? Maybe depending on, you can stop now. <laughs> what kind of shoulder you have, maybe it pinches, maybe it pulls, maybe there's some tightness, right? And that's just us basically waving at each other for 10 seconds. Um, so humeral elevation it should be hopefully no surprise that it's connected to injuries. And this is fairly well documented. We have pretty strong evidence that exists to combine these two. Um, so this is just a screenshot from one systematic review or meta-analysis. So a meta-analysis is when you take a whole bunch of studies and group all that those analyses together to try and get a really strong one. So what this is showing, I just put it here, but it probably doesn't. Mean, but what it's showing is that if you have elevation in your job, you're two times more likely to have ro a rotator cuff disorder, which is your most common shoulder injury. So we have some pretty strong evidence for raising our arm up and down. However, your arm also moves in other ways, and in particular, it also can axially rotate. So let's all actually rotate our arm. Pick an arm. You can start like this, and let's go in and up. So this is internal, external. Let's do a few of those. This one's, this one's a little bit more like waving. So this one's an interesting one too. Right? I mean, I, I like to think I'm fairly healthy, but I certainly have tightness when I try and go in. It's not the easiest motion to do. So similar as elevation, even just a few of those, you can see maybe where the issue comes. If anyone plays baseball, any, any baseball players in the room? Pitchers? None at all? Okay, well, humoral rotation is huge. They have many millions of dollars sunk into humoral rotation in baseball. Uh, but anyway, it is commonly considered to be associated with MSDs, but our evidence is not as strong. I can't pull up you know, one of 10 systematic reviews and tell you that you're two times more likely to get injured. That we don't have that same evidence for humoral, humoral axial rotation, even though it's a common movement. And that part of that reason, at least that I think, is because it's a lot harder to measure um, and a lot harder to calculate. Because elevation, there's a lot of different ways we can measure it. You can look at it even just in 2D. You could all look at me right now and at least have a guess of how high I've raised my arm. If I'm doing a functional task, like this woman over here, um, and her hands are fixed on the crate, it's a little harder to see. We've exaggerated it here. Her elbows are in in the first one, that's external rotation. Her elbows are out in the second one, that's internal rotation. But if you were just watching her, it would be harder to see and harder to distinguish. Uh, we have to calculate things in 3D when we're doing axial rotation, so it comes with its several problems, in fact. Uh, and because we have to do 3D calculations, we calculate humeral axial rotation with something called Euler angles. Don't worry about it. Don't get hung up on the math or anything like that. Um, but basically, it's just the motion of your humerus relative to your torso or your scapula um, in three different 
directions. And axial rotation is always the last direction that you calculate because there's an order. And because of that, error compounds over time, um, or sometimes, well, I'm going to get technical, sorry guys, the axes align, and they basically don't like that. So there are recommendations out there by the International Society of Biomechanics. They say use an Euler sequence YXY. That's what's up there. But that doesn't work a lot of the time, especially for functional movements, which is what I'm looking at. So here's a different paper, FADKEY 2013. If you can see, hopefully, the dotted lines, the dotted red and green, uh, about midway through, right, they shoot up really high, and then they shoot all the way back down. Well, that's, that's not what your arm's doing. That's not what's happening. This person's just going like this. And that's just from calculation error from that YXY sequence. So the, the um, solid lines are a different sequence, and they look a lot better here, right? But it's because this person's just raising their arm up and down. When we get into multiplanar movement, like, say, lifting a shelf overhead, even these sequences start to break down or they get less accurate because it's not clearly in one plane. So that's all to say is we have some work to do and I will talk to you about that shortly, but I also want to introduce the scapula before we really get deep into the actual science that we've done in my lab. Um, so your scapula is your shoulder blade, right? Probably don't think too much about your scapula in daily life, but I'm doing it for you, so don't worry about it. Um, so similar to what I've already said, we care about this because the way that the scapula moves probably is associated with injury, maybe high, uh, high risk or harmful. We look at it in a little different way. The humerus is more of an exposure. How often you raise your arm up and down is an exposure. The way the scapula moves is more of an individual risk factor. It's a little harder to characterize across a population, but I still think very important to how each person develops an injury. We have fairly strong evidence to associate decreased upward rotation of the scapula with this rotator cuff disease. I have SAPS here, subacromial pain syndrome, they're the same thing. Um, upward rotation of the scapula, if this is my scapula, like behind my back, upward rotation is just when it tilts up like this with your arm. So that's just saying if you don't have enough rotation up as you lift your arm up, it's a harmful position. Basically, it overloads your muscles on top and it may or may not pinch the tendons and the bursas in this little space on the top of your shoulder. Um, however, all of the strong evidence that we have, these systematic reviews that we have, have purely focused on planar elevation. And planar elevation is lifting my arm up in one plane, either here, maybe here, maybe at 45 degrees, but just lifting it up and down. This is necessary, obviously. This is a fundamental foundational movement that we need to, to first characterized to understand how the scapula moves, but I think we've done that, and now we need to move on to how do you comb your hair? How do you reach up to your mug on the top shelf? How do you reach forward to the stapler at your desk? They're in different planes. I don't reach up for my mug perfectly right here in nice slow movement, right? I might be turned slightly. I might rotate my arm a little bit. Um, so on top of that, on top of the fact there haven't been enough in functional movements, there's also a wide variation in methods for how we're tracking the scapula. And this, the scapula, I mean, I guess before we get into the methods, I just want to get on my soapbox and talk to you about why it's an issue. So you're, the way that your scapula sits on your body, right, it's like on top of your rib, ca rib cage underneath your skin. And I was talking about with the optical motion tracking, there's certain points we want to track. I would put markers on certain points of your body, like your medial epicondyle. If I did that to your scapula, let's say in the first um, schematic thing, that red X, I put that point on your skin, because that's a point I care about on the scapula. As soon as it, the scapula rotates up, the marker stays on the skin and your scapula isn't there anymore. Right? So it's a tricky one to measure because it's not like you can put a cluster right on the arm or even keep the individual ones on. Um, you have to have a cluster. So we do have a way to do that. I, again, did not create this. I'm standing on the shoulders of some wonderful research researchers that have figured this out. And so we put what's called a rigid cluster on the acromion. So let's all find our acromion together because why not? So if you touch the outside of your shoulder, uh, kind of start on the outside. Hopefully you'll feel a little bit of a, more of a prominent bump. You guys find our bump? So that's your acromial clavicular joint. So where your collarbone meets your shoulder blade. If you sort of just push off that bump 
I always say jump off, but kind of push off, there's a more of a flat spot. I call it the shelf. It's the acromion shelf. Do you kind of feel that kind of a flatter expanse relatively? That's your acromion. So it's not that big, but it's bigger than really any other part <laughs> that's accessible for motion capture. So we put a cluster like this one. It has a small base, and you put it on that small part of your acromion. And then it more or less does move with your scapula. And we can use that rigid body concept to track the scapula. However, that's a pretty small spot that we've put it on, right? And depending on who you are, uh, you might have a lot of tissue. Maybe you have like really big deltoids that are getting in the way of this. So as you raise your arm up or you move it in different planes, the cluster could move on your skin and, and not necessarily with your shoulder blade. So our solution to that is something called a double calibration. And this was first introduced in 2011, so it's, it's not really that old of a method. And all this is doing, there's a whole bunch of words here, but you know what, don't even worry about it. It's just calibrating or finding your points with your arm at rest, finding them again with your arm up, and then basically adjusting your calibration. So adjusting for how the tracking cluster moves. Um, I thought about doing a whole slide on this, but I just, one graph over here, this is, uh, it says 2022, but it was accepted in 2019 because publishing is crazy. Um, but we looked at the accuracy of this double calibration versus a single. Um, and so the, the gray bars are single, so we just found the important points with the arms at rest. The black bars are double, so we did the two positions. And you can see that the errors um, are lower for the black bars. And then as we get to maximum humeral elevation, that's on the bottom, the x-axis there, you can see the big difference between the two methods, hopefully, right? Um, so that was significant. Um, and uh, yeah, I found this double calibration is probably best if you want to do anything above 120, which is probably of interest. However, a lot of the work that's been done to figure out how to track the scapula, that last uh, one of my papers included, has almost exclusively been done, again, in planar elevation. Um, and very constrained. So you're constrained to exactly one plane. If I want my arm out in this side, there'd be like a pole or a, or a half wall or something to stop you from moving your arm this way. Sometimes there's metronome, so you have to move at a specific speed. So quite constrained. Um, for good reasons. That's the easiest way to make comparisons if we control for a bunch of things. But it doesn't necessarily tell us how you actually move in real life. Right, so what about functional tasks? They're in more than one plane. You have a goal. Your, time, your speed may vary, right? When you're combing your hair during the day, you're not you know, moving the same speed every time nice and controlled, right? So I'm curious about how can we confidently, or can we confidently track um, in these functional tasks? So that gets us into the actual sign. I mean, that was a lot of background, but I think good for, for our audience, hopefully. Um, and so now we're going to talk about some of the actual projects that we've done recently in the lab in exploring and validating our best practice methods for humoral and scapular motion. Hopefully I've sold you, I think, on why that's a problem and why we've done the work. So we're going to go through them step by step pretty quickly through each one, um, culminating them and applying them here at the bottom. I'm just going to take a quick drink. So first things first, uh, we decided to look at the repeatability of measuring the scapula and the humerus in functional tasks. I just want to take, bring your attention to the top right corner of the slide. I put a little image there of the cameras because for this one we're talking about the cameras um, and the next one too, but then we switched to talking about the IMU. So I put it up there just so you know which motion capture system I'm talking about, if that matters to you at all. So we looked at the consistency of scapular and humeral kinematics. Um, in functional tasks. Accuracy is important. Maybe you're thinking that. I don't know. Accuracy is important, but it's challenging. How would you, would you get someone to stop midway through a, an overhead reach and try and palpate their scapula? Probably not. That's not externally valid, we would say. That's not how a person really moves in life. Your other option would be to put them in front of like an x-ray, um, which comes with its own challenges. Or your gold standard is actually to drill pins into bones, and then for sure you know how the bone is moving. But hopefully I don't have to elaborate too much <laughs> about why that might be an issue. So I focused on consistency, because accuracy is hard to measure. But if I can at least be confident in how consistent my measures are, I can be confident in my comparisons between groups um, or between time points. 
That makes sense? You're with me? Uh, so my previous postdoc, Dr. Kenzie Friesen, and I uh, worked on this one. And it's published in JBiomech if you're interested. Uh, so it was a test retest. So that means that we brought people into the lab two times, but in a, a short time span, like probably less than a week or two. We had 30 participants, uh, and they did what I've been calling the Work-Related Activities and Functional Task Protocol, or the RAFT Protocol. Uh, this is just a collection of seven to eight tasks, depending on where we are in the presentation, of functional movements. It's not like I've recreated the wheel by creating a new movement. I'm just trying to group these together in a protocol that uh, we could repeat uh, in different populations. So it doesn't take too long, but we capture all the different ways, hopefully, that the arm can move. Um, you know, consistently. Because a lot of times in the literature, if you, do, if you do look for functional tasks, someone over here has done combing and wash axilla, someone over here has done a few different reaches, but it doesn't capture all the different ways. So trying to combine these, all these tasks together um, in a protocol we can use over and over again. Uh, so there was a comb hair, anything unilateral, so one-handed, they also did on the other side. So there was a comb hair, uh, wash opposite axilla, tie apron, there's no picture here, but that was bilateral. Uh, this was, you know, I was trying to get at the movement of a perineal care, your hand to back pocket, but with a little more pizzazz. Uh, and I wear an apron all the time, so I thought this was an incredibly functional movement. However, I ask everyone who comes to the lab in a very small amount. Wear it. Does anyone wear an apron when they cook? Wow. I got a new apron for Christmas this year, that's how much I wear them. Anyway, it still gets at the movement. You still have to reach behind your back. Yeah, you wear an apron? Thank you, we're buddies now. <laughs> Gets behind our back, because that, that can be a uh, difficult movement depending on your abilities. Uh, and then these last ones are more work focused. So there's an overhead reach, you reach overhead, a side reach, forward transfer, you're basically reaching forward, and then a floor to waist lift and an overhead lift. No pictures of the last two. So like I said, not setting the world on fire for each task, but trying to collect them together um, and, and the idea is that we would look at the consistency of our measurements in these tasks. So for the sake of time, I took out the humerus one because we can only look really at maximum. And so just hopefully you can take me at my word. Hopefully you trust me in the last 28 minutes that it looks fine. Okay, you can look up the paper. Uh, but repeatability of the scapula was really the heart of this. And so what I'm showing here are our repeatability outcomes. I'll, Lots of numbers here, I'll walk you through it. But there's three tasks here. There's a comb hair task in one column, overhead reach, and then we did also do planar flexion. I just didn't mention it on the last slide. And I want to direct your attention to scapular upward rotation um, and this MDC. So MDC stands for minimal detectable change. It's just a statistical measure that gives us, gives us an idea of what size of a change is important. So if, you know, if something changes 11 degrees, is that probably real or is that just natural variability between time points or between people? So upward rotation I'm highlighting because, as I mentioned, it's pretty well connected to musculoskeletal disorders. So looking at the values here, they're, at least they're all similar across the tasks. The comb hair, the overhead reach, and the flexion, they're all elevation-based tasks. Um, and our MDC is, what, 11 to about 18. So um, not bad, but not great. Uh, not outside of the realm what's been presented in the literature, but still a little higher than certainly I was hoping for. But it does bring me comfort that the planar, eleva or the, yeah, planar elevation was similar to the functional tasks. And also these tasks, aside from saying start here and end here, we didn't constrain it in any other way. So people could move however they want. So that considered, the values aren't too bad. But, oh, and then, and then this is my waveforms. So this is just showing the average waveforms. I quite like this. Uh, the black line is session one. The red line is session two. So even though we had those MDCs, the average waveforms really align quite nicely for all three um, different angles of the scapula. So that was also very comforting. Uh, but now, we also, of course, looked at the full protocol. So the other tasks we considered are non-elevation based tasks. So like the wash axilla, you kind of moved your arm across, right? The tie apron, we went behind. So I'll highlight some MDCs here, starting with upper rotation again. 
So again, I mean, not necessarily outside of the realm, but definitely, like, I mean, the 9.45 there, not too bad. But 19, 18, 20, 21, not very thrilled about that. That's pretty high, especially considering, you know, your arm's only going to maybe 60. And then I also want to highlight scapular tilt. So scapular tilt is when your scapula just tilts forward or tilts backward. Um, and all I really have to say about this is like, yikes, right? <laughs> 34, 40, 60, I mean, you're not, you're not gonna find anything really worthwhile if that's your MDC. So in conclusion, we're like, all right, we have something here. Some of the tasks are okay, especially considering their unconstrained nature. Other ones are the pits. <laughs> so what can we do to address that? And our solution was building on this calibration idea that I touched on, right? I touched on how we can put a marker on the media epicondyle and then track it. And then I introduced for the scapula, we do that double calibration. We do it at neutral and we do it at maximum. So we're like, okay, what if we change our calibration poses? What if we pick calibration pose poses that better match the tasks we're doing, right? Because like I said, the tie apron goes behind our back. Well, that's very different than our two calibration poses. So what if we introduce those? Will that make things more consistent? You're about to find out. So again, a test retest. We only did 10 participants for this one, but they did the exact same RAF protocol. And then we palpated their um, anatomical points or did the calibrations in five different positions. So neutral, maximum elevation, 90 degrees of abduction, hand to contralateral shoulder, which is similar to the wash axilla, and a hand to lower back, which is a little different than the tie apron, but a very repeatable motion. And we did the same analysis. So this is taken right from, I, it's a little busy, but it's taken right from the paper and I like it. Um, so it's a selection of tasks, again, so I've got wash axilla, tie apron, overhead reach, um, and that side reach. So we're looking again at just, I'm um, presenting upward rotation. We do look at all of the angles, but for the sake of time, I'm not gonna walk you through every table. So I wanna highlight this. This is again an MDC in the wash axilla, and each of those five numbers in that red box is a different, uh, calibration end procedure. So there's either just neutral or, you know, our top position was here, 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 right, so on. So even without considering the different positions, these numbers are better than the, the one I, slide I showed you before, right? 18, 19, 20, 23. These are all lower. And then I also want to highlight this yellow box here. The elevation top um, double calibration is what we used in the last study. Now it's at 10. We're a lot happier with 10, even though that's the same calibration procedure as before. And same thing here, I'm a lot happier with those values down at 9.6, down from like 20, right? Over here, overhead reach, same thing. A uh, little high at the bottom there, but that's not a surprise because these are our two positions. But again, looking at that double calibration, which we were using before, eight degrees. Uh, I don't know, to you maybe that seems pretty high, to me I'm over the moon, that's fantastic, that's the level of error we're seeing a lot, uh, at least in upper limb kinematics. Gait might be a little tighter because it's more of a repeatable motion. So we're pretty happy with that. Um, oh, I also wanted to show you tilt, because right, tilt was, I was like 60 degrees. Uh, so this is the same table but on tilt, trying to just direct you, I don't know, I have all these different colors which maybe don't make as much sense anymore. But showing you again, I'm just gonna highlight the, the double calibration which we were already using brought down a lot in this study. You know, from like 60 to <laughs> four, 13, that type of thing. So you're probably wondering, if, you're, if you have any attention span left, you're probably wondering why. And I can't say for sure, but I do have a few theories. I, th well, I mean, first conclusion, it looks like the methods we were using already are good. So that, that's good. I think what's happening perhaps is experience in palpating or finding the points on the scapula is playing a big role. Uh, Dr. Fries and the postdoc did them in the first study, I did, did them in this study, um, and I've done a lot more work surrounding it, so maybe my experience in finding those points made me very consistent. However, I've buried the lead a little bit here because another consideration is an external device. So we call it the locator, we did have it in the very first study. We did use it, um, but I think I used it very strictly. I don't think I did. <laughs> I know, I was there. I used it very strictly in the second study because what this locator did is I could adjust it to the three points of the scapula, right? And then once it's to those points, no matter how you move your arm, your scapula dimensions haven't 
changed, right? So I can use that to define the points a lot easier. And I use that very strictly so that any errors I saw between calibration poses weren't because I made a mistake. It was because from the actual pose. So even though experience might play a role, I actually think the external device played a bigger one. Even though it was used and available in the first study, I think we need to use it very strictly and really follow it. Um, and that will help us hopefully be more consistent. But overall, these first few projects said, OK, I'm feeling pretty good about this. Using select methods, um, it looks like we have decent repeatability in functional tasks. You know, we did a lot of work to end up right back where we started. Right? It was like, here, we're going to do this. Oh, this didn't work. Oh, it turns out it does work. Um, that's science, I guess. <laughs> but at least uh, we, we went through it. We were able to test a hypothesis. It didn't turn out the way that we planned. But I have some very actionable things moving forward. Anyone who comes through my lab, we do a lot of reps. Oh, what a kin word. We do a lot of reps <laughs> of palpating. I do a lot of checking. I give them the locator, and they use it every time. So from there, we were happy with what is happening in the lab. The, the marker cluster we have that we use in the lab is, is working pretty well. Uh, but now, right, the title of my talk is Taking It Out Into the Wild. And I told you at the very beginning that we can't take the cameras out in the, into the wild. So we wanted to test is the, these methods with this locator, uh, with these palpations. Is this going to work with IMUs? Because they, they do do things a little bit differently. So question one here was, can they ac be accurately tracked with IMUs as compared to optical motion capture? And then another question was, does where we put the IMU matter? Right? So at the beginning, I had everyone find their chromian. Hopefully, we can remember that 10 minutes ago. Because uh, that's normally where we put it for optical motion capture. The literature for IMU says we should put it along the scapular spine, which is kind of more in the middle there. But the people who do that don't do the double calibration. So we're like, OK, we'll test both positions and see if our calibration changes anything. So same, well, this was the same data as that very first study. Um, so same 30 participants, same tasks, same double calibration. But between sessions, instead of it being repeatability, we changed where the scapular tracking IMU went. So position one, you can see the orange square on the acromion. Position two, it went along the uh, spine, but of course they were randomized. So I don't have a lot of data here. I don't want to get too dragged down into this because it all basically points to the same thing. Um, both positions were pretty good. So we looked at ICCs, which are just a consistency measure, and RMSCs, root mean square error, just an error measure. So you can see this is just one task I'm showing you. Comb hair, the RMSCs are less than 10 mostly which, like I said, is more or less what we're going for and about the best we can hope for in an unconstrained task like that. And similarly, our, our waveforms look quite nicely. So there's the acromion placement. There's the spine placement. Black line is Vicon or optical. Red line is XNs, and they track pretty nicely. So again, there's a lot more data in it. Feel free to look at the paper. But it all comes together to the same point, which is that we're pretty happy with how the IMUs are performing, with where we've placed them, and our double calibration. Um, and based on these current results, it looks like you could place the IMU in either spot, which is nice, because depending on where you are, maybe it's easier to, maybe they're wearing a tank top, it's easier to get here. Maybe with a certain shirt, it's easier to come down into the neck. So either option will be fine. Oh, yeah. It's OK. We're getting near the end. So I'll quickly touch on this because I'm sure, I'm just positive, you're all wondering, but Dr. Lang, what about the humerus, right? I'm sure you're wondering that. <laughs> I spent the last 15 minutes or so talking to you about the scapula, but I did introduce the humerus. So I'll quickly go through this one because I wondered the same thing. What about the humerus? If I measure it with IMUs, am I getting the same values as if I measure it with the cameras? Because as I said, those Euler angles are they're less than ideal. So that's what we tested. We took the same participants and said, OK, if we measure with the two systems, when we compare them, are they the same? What if we add in a different calculation method because we know Euler angles are a bit of a problem? So I'll skip through there. <clears throat> so we had Euler angles versus true axial rotation. Don't have to worry too much about the math on this. Um, but it's just a different way of calculating how your humerus rotates. A person called uh, Clevis Al Aliege. Did it. I actually they provided code in a repository. I was able to contact him. He's a wonderful person. He helped me work through this um, to be able to compare these two measures in functional tasks. 
So I really like this. I'm, I, I, it's maybe, no, I don't think it's too busy. It's one of my favorite figures that we've ever put in a paper because I think it so clearly shows the entire paper. So I'll quickly walk you through it. The black solid line is our cameras, Euler angle, so the traditional way. Blue solid lines are the IMUs, traditional way. Dotted black line, our cameras, new way, so true axial. Blue dotted line, our IMU, new way. Okay, hopefully we're following that. So solid lines are our traditional way. Uh, dotted lines are the new way. And I think you can see quite plainly how nicely the two dotted lines align with one another in all of these tasks. So these are just the selection of six tasks. I don't have overhead lift on it because it looks so similar to overhead reach. Um, right, the two dotted lines in all of these track pretty nicely, where the solid lines sometimes are quite different. Like if you look at the middle top, B, Right, that's like 20 degrees of difference. At least we're getting a similar waveform, which is comforting, um, but that's quite a big angle difference um, ev just between two systems on the same person at the same time. So we decided, even though Euler angles are generally accepted, that's what people do, um, Consistency is important to me, like I said. I can't always confirm accuracy, but at least I can be consistent. So we decided that moving forward with true axial rotation measurement, it's our most consistent, that's what we're gonna do. Um, it may provide more realistic estimations, but I can't say for sure. Okay, so kind of last few things, put this all together, it's been a lot of methods. Hopefully you're sticking with me. Um, Right? There's a lot, like I said, there's a lot of work to do. We have to figure out what's our best way to measure and track this and measure and track that. And now we're, we're trying to take it out. Uh, so quickly, I'll take you through. We did all that work in the lab. Everything I've talked about has happened in the lab, but I've been talking about taking it out into the wild. So we decided the first step was to take it out into the wild, but try and take as much of the lab with us at first. So what we did is we tried to recreate those exact same raft tasks in a bunch of different field positions. Because there's possible there's environmental influences, it's possible that there's just logistical trick, like problems if you're going to go to someone's house or to their farm or to a ball diamond. So that's, what, that's exactly what we did. We went to houses and farms and ball diamonds and we measured people doing those exact same raft tasks with the IMUs. Um, and then we compared lab to field. So a little asterisk here, it is, is, it is two different groups, right? So I couldn't do traditional agreement methods because if I had tested, say, myself in the lab and then myself in the field, it's still me, so I can compare them. But if I test me in the field and you in the field, we can't look at agreement because we're already starting two different. That said, it's still the same tasks. Um, between groups comparisons are done quite a bit, so I, we felt this was a valid approach. Um, so the, <coughs> this is just showing the full waveforms for all of these tasks. Um, the bottom half is this SPM test, so it can tell you if there's differences at any point in the waveform. Um, overall, right, looking pretty good, <laughs> considering these are different people with a different shelf. Fairly similar. A few differences, right? Wash Exilla, you can see overhead reach, there's a difference at the very beginning, this, I think, well, we don't think we know, the shelf setup was a little bit different, but overall they're tracking quite closely. Axial rotation looks similar, scapular upward rotation, pretty good, a little more variability, but no significant differences, and, uh, you know, some of them align really nicely, especially on those waveforms, which I think is really cool. <laughs> However, then this happened, yeah. Uh, so this is scapular internal rotation. Ooh, I lost it again. So it's like essentially rounding your shoulders. Something broke down there in the field. I think we can agree. Um, <laughs> we're still working out what this is. It's, and it's not just one person causing this wide variability. Something's happened in the, like either it's the calibration or the setup or something. It, it's just the sensors think they're more rotated than they are. Um, our current theory is, is a, some sort of distortion because if the sensors are going to be distorted, it's going to be around this, at, like, this axis. Um, but we're still working through that. So I see John in the background. If you have any thoughts, I'd love to hear them. <laughs> but uh, even still, we're pretty happy with this because at least we're really confident in humeral elevation, axial rotation, scapular upward rotation, and scapular tilt. So we can still take those four angles into the field and calculate them. Internal rotation, we have some work to do. All right, last couple of slides. I uh, don't have a lot of data here, but it's just to say we have done this. 
We have attempted to take them out into the wild. Um, so we actually took the measurements, as I mentioned, to a uranium mine up north. There's uh, Denise, my PhD student, um, help me with this. So that's actually us underground. And the <laughs> sorry, the black circle's covering the wrong person. Uh, we're underground. I'm doing a scapular calibration on this worker, 480 meters underground, which is which was a trip. Um, so we're getting into the work. We were able to look at a whole bunch of different jobs on the mine site, and so we're comparing them. Denise is hard at work at this. Uh, we did have some issues. The, there's magnetometers in the IMU, so there was some distortion, which I was hoping wasn't going to be as bad as it was, but yeah, we're working through it. But it was still really cool to be able to, to do that. We were definitely going to be able to get some elevation and neck flexion and stuff like that. And we learned a lot. <clears throat> and then last but not least, uh, I am in the Canadian Centre for Rural and Agricultural Health, so I care a lot about agriculture, and that's where a lot of my ergonomics work is going. Um, so we have an ongoing project that's on pause because it's so cold, uh, but looking at farmers do work tests. So we're starting having them do some standardized work tests. So everyone does a shovel, everyone does an overhead drill, everyone carries a seed bag up their cedar, um, and we're going to try and characterize what type of postural exposures exist in that task. Um, and then we also plan, Vincent Akin Louis, the master student on it, he's going to look at a healthy group, compare sex and age. We're also going to bring in a pain group and compare them. So there's going to be a lot of variability, yes, but I think it will be interesting to know that if person A has pain and they do a shovel in their own farm this way, and it's different than person B who doesn't have pain, th there's something of interest there. We're not controlling as much, but I think hopefully we're going to get at some more like real life in situ factors, which could be um, causing or, or you know associated with injury. So that brings us to the end. Thank you. It's a few minutes over. Um, so we've worked through. Hopefully, we'll be able to follow along a little bit. We have identified at least some best practice methods for measuring and calculating the scapular and humeral kinematics or movement with two different types of motion capture. We're, we're confident using these methods moving forward, and we plan to, not only the ergonomic stuff, but we have clinical work as well, uh, looking at breast cancer survivors, uh, the general population with shoulder pain, people with arthritis. However, there's still work to do. I'm excited to do it. Um, and you know, maybe in a few years, I'll have an update for you. So just want to quickly thank my lab. This is an outdated picture. We need a new one. As you can tell, this is my favorite blazer. Um, <laughs> So we don't have a few of the students in the picture, but big thanks to the lab and funding sources that have funded the project. So that's it. Thanks, guys.